I have not been here for a while. And so if I might, I thought I'd start in a, a little bit of a strange place, and that is by teaching you a secret about preaching. Lately, I've been finding solace in the writings of a Danish philosopher and pastor, Soren Kierkegaard. Some of you will know his work. I find myself returning to him again and again lately in these days of conflict and angst that is both political and spiritual. Kierkegaard wrote a lot about preaching, as it turns out, and by no means do I suggest that you should read all of it. But here are a few words of his that I thought were as good a starting point as any for today. People have an idea that the preacher is an actor on a stage, and they are the critics blaming or praising the result. What they don't know is that they are the actors on the stage. The preacher is merely the prompter standing in the wings, reminding them of their lost lines. So, if you remember nothing else about what you're about to hear, remember that my labors here for the next few minutes are meant to help you remember your lines. I have noticed something recently. I wonder whether you have noticed it too. The way it first came to my notice was just feeling a little bit less anxious, a little bit less tense, even with the terrible events of these past days, just a little less stress. And then I finally, suddenly realized that there was a simple reason for this. It is that almost miraculously, as though it were part of the change of the seasons, I am suddenly seeing other people's faces, noses, and mouths, and smiles, and teeth. All right, not everywhere, not in here, not inside, but oh, outside. Walking along the sidewalks, or taking a stroll along the Seine, I can see the whole faces of people. It's something I never thought I would appreciate so much. Those gentle nods of saying hello, Huh? The smile that says, I see you, or that's a beautiful child, or I like your dog. All the world of nonverbal communication that we have been deprived on is coming back little bit by little bit. Surtout lorsque vous travaillez dans votre langue seconde, those little nonverbal cues are essential. One of the deep theological truths I learned working in a behavioral science laboratory is that we humans read an immense amount of data from each other's faces. We make almost instantaneous judgments about other people's social class, their ethnicity, even their moral character from their faces. Of course, a lot of that we get wrong, but we get it fast. And all of that is operating subconsciously to tell us all the time and very quickly, am I safe here? Is this person friend or foe? Most of us of a certain age who grew up in the United States and had to go through high school English knew Nathaniel Hawthorne's short essay, The Minister's Black Veil. The Reverend Mr. Hooper, the parson of Hawthorne's fictional town in the New England coast of Milford, suddenly appears one Sunday morning in his church with a veil of black crepe over his face. And from that moment on, for the rest of his short life, he never removes it. Not for church, not for meetings, not even for conversation with his fiancée. 
At the very first glimpse of their troubled parson, an old lady of the congregation exactly summarizes how everybody feels. I don't like it, she muttered as she stumbled into the meeting house. He has changed himself into something awful only by hiding his face. Well, we come to know as we read the story just why the people in that Parsons church see that veil as something deeply disturbing. It is because by being confronted with what seems to be Parson Hooper's awareness of his own sinfulness, they cannot escape a confrontation with their own as well. Nathaniel Hawthorne knew his Bible, and he must surely have been aware of the contrast he was drawing between Parson Hooper and Moses. Parson Hooper wears a veil because of his profound awareness of God's holiness. Moses wears a veil because he has been in the presence of God's holiness. The story of Moses we heard read this morning happens at a pivotal point in the arc of the Exodus story. This is the second time Moses has been up the mountain to receive the covenant code, the Ten Commandments. The first time, while he was away for 40 days and 40 nights, the people got impatient and they built themselves an idol to worship. And that was, to put it mildly, the source of great disruption. When he comes back and sees what has happened, Moses breaks the tablets in his anger. Well, this time, Moses has been called back up the mountain. God tells him to bring two new tablets. But this time, the story is headed in a different direction. Because when it is over, God is going to come and dwell among his own people in the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. After this happens, God will stay with God's people, a presence among them. At the very end of Exodus, Exodus, the last scene is the cloud coming down over the tabernacle, God dwelling with God's people. So the radiance of Moses' face is a sign of things to come. In a crucial moment in the people's history, he has gone up the mountain which is another way of saying he has brought himself as close as possible to God in prayer. And because of that, he is changed. Changed in such a way that people can see his relationship with God and how it has changed him in a way that God intends for it to change them too. The message is that God will be with them so that all of them can draw near to God in prayer. And if they do, they will be changed, changed into the people God is calling them to be. It is no accident that the architects of the lectionary have brought together for us this Exodus story of Moses and the story of Jesus' transfiguration. Because for the first Christians, the transfiguration story was a profoundly Jewish story, one that echoed a part of the story of the Jewish people and their liberation that even non-Jews would have known and loved. This story, too, comes at a pivotal moment in our history. It is the hinge between the beginning and the end of Jesus' ministry on earth. Because not long after this story in Luke's gospel, you will read these words, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, the confrontation with the evil he will conquer. If the story about Moses pointed toward a time that God would come to dwell among God's people, Luke is telling us that story with a different ending. God has come to dwell among the people in the person of Jesus. And again, the ark is the same. It's a pivotal moment in the history of God's story. Jesus has brought himself close to God in deep prayer. And when it is all over, Jesus doesn't need a veil 
to obscure or avoid God's presence because he is God. He doesn't re simply reflect God's glory. He is God's glory. No more need for a tabernacle. God in Christ has come to dwell with us as one of us. These two stories are different in their specifics, but they are bound together by a common theme. In crucial moments, we sense a need to draw close to God in prayer. And when we do, something about us, something others can see, changes. Something shines. Something helps others see God at work in us. Well, this is a crucial moment. This is an anguishing moment. People who are our neighbors, people in Ukraine, are in agony at this moment. They are desperate to hold on to their dignity and their country. For most of us here this morning, we have rarely, if ever, lived through days in which events that will shape the future for our children and our grandchildren, their possibilities and their prospects have hung so gravely in the balance. We cannot see today how this will unfold, what all this will mean, not just for Ukraine, but for Europe, not just for nations, but for our hopes, for the fundamental ideas of human rights and self-determination, the sovereignty of the people, all of which are different expressions of the same basic idea, our baptismal covenant idea, human dignity. And at just this moment, people of God, people of God, the veils are coming off our faces. And I am wondering, the people around you are wondering, has something about you changed? Have you been risking praying? If there has ever been a moment in our lives when it was time for us to draw nearer to God in prayer, this is that moment. Not the sort of laundry list prayers that we tend to stack up with God. Not the kind of prayer that pleads before God the treatment we think that we are entitled to. No, it is the prayer that risks being in the presence of God. Prayer that is more about our silence than our speaking. Prayer that is more about our listening than our longing. Prayer that will guide us, quiet us, assure us, and change us. My fellow ministers, even though the spring is coming, even though it feels like the pandemic is ending, these are dark days. And it may well be that the days ahead grow darker still. The people around us, the world around us, desperately needs our shining faces. They need to know and see a difference in us because we have dared to draw near the presence of God, because they are desperate to know that there is a God to draw near to, a God who will still vindicate what is right and good and true. Lent is nearly upon us. We could do much worse than spending it finding new ways to dare that practice of prayer. The church is here to help you with that. So here's your line for Lent. Are you ready? When you see your friends here, when you see your fellow ministers here, in the pews or in the hallways or at sandwich ministry or wherever you see them, here is your line. You say to them, has something changed about you? 
you look different somehow. You have this, I don't know, glow. What have you been doing? And then, if you are the one on the other end of that question, tell them, friends. Tell them. Amen.